Okay, welcome to the uh, panel called Bloggers and Blue Collars Workers Unite. You have nothing to lose but Wall Street domination. Our purpose here today is not to lecture. Uh, it is to engage in an interactive discussion about the common interests of the blogosphere and the concerns of uh, working people, especially as it relates to the productive economy in the United States. And to do that, we have a terrific panel with us. Uh, my name is Scott Paul. I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance for American Manufacturing. We're a partnership between the United Steelworkers Union, which is America's largest industrial union, and some of its manufacturers. We, we work on issues designed to promote good jobs in communities across America. Uh, I'm joined by Leo Girard, who is the uh, President of the United Steelworkers Union. Uh, Congresswoman Donna, Donna Edwards from Maryland, uh, who is a, uh, who I am lucky to have as my member of Congress, but uh, who is also a, a beacon in the progressive community. Uh, I'm joined by Marcy Wheeler, who is, uh, uh, who, who runs Empty Wheel on Fire Dog Lake and is a, an accomplished blogger on economic and manufacturing issues. Uh, Bob Borisage, uh, who is the, uh, founder and co-director of uh, Campaign for America's Future. And I'm also joined by T Tula Connell, a former colleague of mine at the AFL-CIO. She's still there. And she uh, operates their uh, highly regarded uh, blog and uh, will be able to provide us with some uh, a good perspective on that. Uh, I'm just going to make a brief comment. And we're going we're gonna to run this in an interactive fashion with a couple of questions for each panelist and then a, then a good opportunity uh, to engage in a conversation with all of you uh, about why you're here and what you need to know and uh, actually how, what we can do uh, to uh, persuade you and your readers uh, that, that uh, this is an issue worth thinking about. Um, first, a couple of facts about manufacturing to, to set this up. We've lost 30% of all manufacturing jobs in this country just over the last decade. Uh, they've disappeared at an extraordinary rate. We've never seen this sort of decimation before. 83% uh, of our trade deficit, when you leave out oil, is with one country right now, China. It's the most imbalanced trade relationship in the world. We'll talk about the consequences that that has. Manufacturing workers, contrary to public perceptions in the United States, are among the most productive in the world and their compensation level is actually uh, on par or below uh, most OECD countries in the manufacturing sector. Traditional manufacturing is part of the new economy. There are 250 tons of steel in every wind turbine that's manufactured. In every hybrid automobile, there's nearly a ton of steel that goes into that. Steel made in the United States has one-third of the carbon footprint of a uh, ton of steel made in China. <coughs> Manufacturing, even though it's a shrinking sector of our economy in terms of employment, where it employs less than 9 percent of people, in terms of gross domestic product, where it, uh, where it accounts for about 12 percent of our economy right now, has an outsized effect on America's economy. Forty percent of all engineers in the United States are employed in the manufacturing sector. 80% of the, all the patents generated in the United States come from the manufacturing sector. Two-thirds of all private sector research and development that's performed in the United States is performed in the manufacturing sector. Manufacturing is still one of the top three economic activities in 40 states. Manufacturing also has an outsized political impact. If you're considering races at the local, state, federal level uh, in presidential races, and you look at some of the swing states that are out there today, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, North Carolina, Virginia, Missouri, and I can go on, they all have, are, are dominated by manufacturing. And so it will continue to be a political issue for years to come. I want to first turn to Bob Borisage uh, and just ask him, uh, in his view, sort of why Campaign for America's Future came to this, and I think, uh, more importantly, 
what are the common links between the issues that are facing the productive economy and the progressive movement in general and some of the things that we've all been fighting against and for for a while? Uh, well, thanks, Scott. And uh, let me uh, commend to you the, uh, the booth that uh, AAM has outside where you can get a hard hat and uh, other information about manufacturing. Also, let me do a plug for uh, a report that's distributed, I think, on all of your chairs. It's called Pittsburgh, the Rest of the Story, done by one of the scholars at the campaign. And it goes through uh, looking at Pittsburgh's revival after the decline in the 70s and 80s uh, and talks through uh, both the, the elements of that revival, uh, that it was not done by the miracle of free laissez-faire capitalism, but by economic development planning and industrial strategy, uh, public and private cooperation, and the limits of it how some of the jobs that uh, have started to grow in the entertainment business and restaurants, et cetera, pay less than half, sometimes less than a third, of the manufacturing jobs that are still leaving. Um, and the results that that has on uh, any society in terms of sustaining a middle class. Uh, so with that plug, let me just talk a little bit to Scott's question. Uh, we're headed into the greatest debate about the American economy, or we're in the midst of the greatest debate about the American economy, really since the Great Depression. Uh, and the reason for that is you can't have a recovery out of this uh, recession. You can't go back to the old economy, uh, and you shouldn't want to. You can't go back because we can't, as a country, keep borrowing $2 billion a day, which we were while this economy was working before the downturn. Uh, largely from abroad, largely from Chinese and Japanese central bankers. Uh, we can't have sus uh, consumers, households spending more than they earn, drawing down on their homes, racking up credit cards, student loans, auto loans, every conceivable kind of consumer loan to, to sustain a middle class lifestyle while their incomes were stagnant or falling. We can't go back to that. We can't have a finance sector that makes 40% of the profits of the country. Uh, and does so by creating these bubbles, the dot-com bubble, the housing bubble that explode in our faces uh, and drive us into the worst downturn. So fundamental changes have to be made. Uh, President Obama has stated this very clearly. He says America has to start building its economy on a foundation that is a rock uh, of investment and production rather than the shifting sands of speculation and debt. Uh, and he's laid out some elements of an alternative. Uh, we're in the midst of the health care fight, needless to say, uh, which is part of building a public social contract to replace what we used to do through the great corporations with unions in negotiations, which are now, the corporations are now shredding. You've got to create a public health care system that gives people affordable health care. Um, we, he's laid out an investment program for new energy, uh, which is part of both meeting the global warming thing and potentially part of a new industrial policy. Uh, He's said that he will support uh, the Employee Free Choice Act, which has got to be a centerpiece of an aggressive wage policy, raising the minimum wage, EFCA, empowering workers, so that workers get a fair share of the profits. All of that, all of those arguments are either started or ongoing, but the discussion about America's economic strategy, about whether we will make things in America, is really, we haven't even begun to discuss. And yet, it is the center of what happens to us uh, as a society, whether we sustain an American dream in reach of most Americans, whether we sustain a broad middle class, or whether we continue to build an economy of, uh, of uh, gilded age inequality uh, in which uh, more and more people uh, sink and, and the few get uh, the, reap the resources of a global marketplace. That debate is the debate that is uh, we have got to put on the agenda that we've got to force into the discussion and that progressives have to be engaged in uh, and that bloggers have to be engaged in. Let me give you one example that I hope Donna will talk about too. We just went through passing the, the an energy bill through the House of Representatives. It was the worst form of legislative sausage making. That you could barely keep your eyes on it while it was so gross, while you looked at what was going into it. Um, but one of the, the assumption of the bill, in part, was that, mumbling again, 
the assumption of the bill in part was that, um, yeah, I'll, I'll swallow it, <laughs> was that um, uh, this would create jobs. And yet there were no uh, provisions for manufacturing and for sustaining manufacturing in the bill, sustaining manufacturing in America in the bill, until uh, a, a, a set of provisions created by Sherrod Brown in the Senate, championed by the Apollo Alliance, uh, got put in, uh, in mid at midnight, literally, when the bill was passed, because they needed the votes of industrial state representatives to pass the bill. Wasn't in the administration's agenda, wasn't in the congressional agenda, wasn't in the bill until the last minute. And yet you would think it would be the centerpiece. Contrast that to China. Scott was talking about how China has 85% of our, product, our manufactured trade deficits with China. The Chinese have decided that new energy is a strategic industry. They now export 95% of the solar panels they produce. They've decided to make wind industry, uh, wind turbines, a centerpiece of their new energy economy. So they're creating huge wind farms. And they uh, created and they let out uh, 25 major contracts to build windmills uh, in, Ch in China. Uh, the European companies that make the best windmills in the country now created Chinese subsidiaries to bid on those contracts. But every contract went to a Chinese company, even those who have never made a windmill in their existence, because the Chinese have designated it as a strategic industry and they want to create the capacity to dominate this industry over time. Now, this is a discussion that is unacceptable in America. As soon as you start talking like this, someone says, that's protectionism, and we can't do that here. And eyes close, minds close, conversation stops. It's like you've you know, burped at a dinner party or something. Uh, it's just simply impolite to go down that route. Yet, we have to break into this discussion and the reason why I think it's important for bloggers is that a lot of this discussion is about stuff that uh, bloggers are really good at. I mean, culturally, bloggers are from the two coasts, tend to be from the two coasts, at least the image of them is. They tend to be new age, high tech, uh, individualistic, um, kind of see manufacturing as part of the dinosaur age that they are not, not a part of. Uh, but the reality is a lot of what this is about is uh, a trade policy defined on Wall Street uh, and among multinationals, enforced in backroom deals in the Congress, uh, that is uh, eroding the American middle class, that is protected by secrecy and by ideology, and that needs to be exposed and debunked and monitored and tracked and people get into the argument and people ex having people ex be un have some people explain to them what's going on. And that is the, the role that the bloggers have played in national security, in war and peace, in secrecy, uh, and it is a role they should play on, on this issue. So it's ex this is why I think progressives have to take it on. This is why I think we've got to get bloggers engaged in this discussion. Uh, it will be about what kind of America we build out of the ruins of the old economy. And it will be the centerpiece of that, and it's a discussion that hasn't yet started. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. I, I want to ask Congresswoman Edwards to uh, comment, uh, because she has a lot of experience fighting against these interests, against the big Wall Street banks and the big insurance companies and some of the big multinationals that have certainly wreaked havoc on uh, consumer policies, uh, health care, efforts to reform the health care system, uh, and a number of other progressive imperatives. And I basically want to ask Donna an open-ended question about her experience with these fights, how she sees these corporate interests on Capitol Hill and what we can do about it. Well, they're there. <laughs> they're definitely there. Um, thanks, Scott. I mean, I think first, um, you know, it's the same corporate interest. And I think that we have to be clear about that. We always think that we're picking separate and different battles, but really it's the same battle and they're the same interest. I mean, they may change industry, um, but it's the same interest. And so I think that the interests that cause the financial meltdown on Wall Street are the same interests that 
have toppled the manufacturing sector in the, in the country. Um, they're the same interest that continues to depress wages and productivity. And they're the same interests that right now we're all aligned against um, in this battle for, uh, for health care. And um, I think that we just have to get, we have to be smarter and more strategic and more focused at fighting them and exposing them. And I think of the net roots, for example, as a, um, as sort of, you know, I don't know, what is it, Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia or something, the force standing between the corporate interests that toppled everything and um, opportunities for the American people. And that comes by doing what many of us who are consumer advocates, and even though I'm in the Congress, I still describe myself as a consumer advocate, um, that comes at doing what we do the best, and it's exposing their interests. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, we were, you know, progressives. We had our hour or so on the House floor to talk about health care. And I just said, we have to start naming names. You know, the names of the CEOs that are pocketing millions and millions of dollars while they lay off workers and turn down people for health care. Um, the lobbying money, advertising money, we see it in health care so clearly if you'd never seen it before. Um, advertising money, lobbying money, all this corporate money that's uh, being spent to manufacture an argument against health care. And I don't think you can separate our challenge of achieving health care for the American people from what's happened in our overall economy. It's so tied uh, to the success of our, our future economy. And when I think about what uh, President Obama has at least characterized in terms of where we need to go for the 21st century, even if all of the puzzle pieces aren't fully laid out, some of that happened in the energy bill, but some really bad stuff actually happened in that bill in the House, too. But I want to talk about a couple of good things, because while it's true that we've made a commitment for more investment in alternative energy than we ever did before, the money that will be U.S. taxpayer money going to buy windmills and wind turbines and uh, solar panels, all of that is going to be taken offshore because the production isn't happening here in the United States. And so while, while on the one hand we've made the commitment to the thing that we know um, will reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, we're sending away all of our resources someplace else because we don't produce it. We've just made the biggest ever new investment in um, high-speed rail. And when you think of the high-speed rail corridors that will be created around the country, when it comes to buying those rail cars, um, and the, uh, the steel that we will need for, those, uh, for the tracks and the technology that we will need and the circuitry that we'll need to, um, to run those lines, it all comes from someplace else other than the United States. And so these are things that, I mean, as Bob described, I mean, it's not sustainable. And so the same corporate interest, uh, their interest is just in moving money. You know, and they don't really care whether the money is moved here or France or, um, or Bangladesh or China. They don't care because they're just interested in moving money. And that's why it's up to public policy to draw the lines about where we care. And I think that Bob is right that we have to create a public policy structure that actually does put the brakes on the corporate interest because if we don't, it's not like they're going to do it themselves. I mean, clearly, that will just never happen. Um, and, you know, I think, for example, in, uh, I was at a plant, um, a, a, one, a manufacturing plant, go figure, uh, out in my district just two days ago, and they manufacture these little one-inch sort of circuit boards, and um, because the technology has actually been developed really for the defense industry, they cannot take that circuit board and sell it for civilian purposes abroad. Now multiple other countries are taking their technology, developing that circuit board, putting their people to work, and selling it back to our civilian interests here in the United States. Just that alone, I mean, seeing that makes no sense. This, is, this happens to be a manufacturing plant where um, the electrical workers are organized at that plant. 
And those workers are running the risk of losing jobs down the line because we can't create, other than a defense mechanism, we can't create other avenues for that circuit board to be manufactured, distributed, and sold here in the United States. It's extraordinary. It, we, I, I, I know that we appreciate all the work that you do uh, to keep them honest um, on Capitol Hill. It's tough times for anyone who's out there uh, advocating, but you're, you're doing a terrific job. Well, I mean, you know, Scott, it has to be a we, too, because, I mean, there are some, and a number of us in the Congress who really want to be able to stand up to these interests and sort of the no fear argument against these corporate interests and calling them out because it's not like I stand, look, it's not like I stand anything to gain from them, that's for sure, and they know that, and so, hey, nobody's lost. Um, but it also takes all of those voices and the ripple effect of voices out in communities talking to and with people and not just with ourselves about what's at stake because that gives us more energy and believe me, the digging that you can do on a corporation, on their CEOs, on their financial interest, on the interconnectedness of their corporations here domestically and around, around the world is more than poor Galen who's back here on my staff. I mean, I just have him and a couple of other people and so we need the net roots in particular to do what you do best and root that out so that we have something to sell. Our job would be then as policymakers to sell and to market that to our colleagues so that we expose these deep connected interests that really are standing in the way of the American worker gaining on the 21st century. Thank you, I think that's a, an important point. Um, some of the issues that uh, the, the Congresswoman is bringing up, we're only gonna be able to scratch the surface of them, but we have a lot of resources available, both at the, the booth that the Alliance for American Manufacturing has. We've distributed some of it here, and there'll be more on the way out, but there's a, th there's a wealth of information that, that, that we're developing, the Campaign for America's Future is developing uh, out there on this. I want to turn now to, to Leo Girard um, and remind people, the Steelworkers Union, uh, it's the largest industrial union in North America. Uh, it, it employs workers not only in steel, but also in clean energy, tire, plastics, rubber, glass, auto parts, paper, you name it, they, they, they make it. They, they make it. Um, one thing, and this is based on something that folks may have seen yesterday, Harold Meyerson did a, a great piece in, in the Washington Post yesterday uh, about you know, one word factories, uh, taking off the graduate uh, line about plastics. In that, he said that it's not bad enough that America doesn't have an industrial policy. We have an anti-industrial policy. And I wanted Leo to comment on that and then also just to offer a framework of what an industrial policy would look like. Well, let, let, me, uh, let me start uh, with a couple of comments that reflect on what uh, Congresswoman said and what Scott just said. Uh, I really believe that uh, in many ways the net roots, the blogosphere, the progressive bloggers are now the front line uh, if we're going to bring about broad-based change in our society. We certainly can't count on what would euphemistically be called the mainstream media uh, and uh, sort of the chattering heads who are most of the time uninformed. Uh, we certainly uh, aren't going to have an industrial strategy fall from the sky. And if you really want to come to some acknowledgement about how bad it is, in the last month, uh, Bill Ford said, the problem with America is we don't have an industrial plan. Last year, Bill Ford was, would have said the exact opposite. Not long after Bill Ford comes the uh, savior of American manufacturing, Jeff Immelt, from CEO, of, CEO of GE, whose predecessor said that what we ought to do is build factories on barges and float them so we can float to wherever we'll get the best deal. Jeff Immelt says, maybe we went too far. <laughs> okay, so uh, 
you are the front line now for us. And those of us that are in organized institutions, whether it's uh, the Congresswoman or whether it's the Apollo Alliance or the Blue Green Alliance Campaign for America's Future, the FFL CIO, those of us that are in these organized institutions uh, need to help you get the message out beyond our traditional base. And uh, when we talk about how do we change, I would say the first thing we got to do is blow up the myths. And the myth is that uh, it isn't the Rust Belt. It's in fact the industrial heartland. And when you start to buy into the term Rust Belt, you start to buy into the mentality that this is the declining sector of the economy, we shouldn't pay attention to it, it's irrelevant, blah, 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 blah. Some of you are going on a tour of a steel mill uh, today. I guess you're going. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something about a steel mill. And I could say this about a glass factory, I could say this about a paper mill, I could say this about almost every major uh, industrial sector of our, of our industries. The fact of the matter is that raw material goes in at one end, it comes out at the other end with next to zero defects, and steel is the most recycled commodity in America, followed by paper, followed by aluminum. So if you want to talk about green jobs, steel is a green job. The fact of the matter is, while we're losing our industrial heartland to places like China, and I'm not blaming the Chinese, by the way, they're doing what we ought to be doing. They're not stealing our jobs, we're giving them our jobs. They're not stealing our technology, we're giving them our technology. But for every ton of steel that's made in China versus every ton of steel that's made in America, we produce three times the amount of carbon emissions. And I could take you through every sector of our economy, whether it's glass, whether it's aluminum, whether it's paper, it's the same story. So we're giving that away. So first we have to blow up the myth about the Rust Belt, and we have to start saying it's the industrial heartland. And then what we, I think we need to do in addition is to get real, to simply think, how do you create real wealth versus how do you create bubble wealth? If you go back to the, I'll, I'll pick at the, uh, the first sort of scandal of financial deregulation, the savings and loans debacle, where Daddy Bush's kids, by the way, did very well. Uh, and we look at the number of bubbles we've had since then that have destroyed illusionary uh, wealth, as, uh, as my, my one friend, uh, says, fantasy finance. Uh, Les Leopold wrote a great book called The Looting of America, and he calls it fan fantasy finance. He goes through all the bubbles we've had. Well, if you look at that, and you look at what we've been doing with regards to the creation of real wealth, you've got to ask yourself a question. How do you create real wealth? You create real wealth by taking raw material, converting it to something else, and adding value to it, and then putting it into the marketplace whether it's the marketplace of real ideas or whether it's the marketplace of durable goods. Well, right now, America is suffering a daily loss, daily loss, as Bob said, of $2 billion a day. Now, the question is, for an economy that's spending now pretty much a given 16% of its GDP, for a healthcare system that's broken, that's probably spending closer to 20% of its GDP in the military side, and that is borrowing $2 billion a day because it can't make anything, the question is how do you get out of that mess? You certainly don't get out of that mess by having uh, economic teabaggers and healthcare teabaggers disrupting meaningful change that will give us an opportunity to move into a more competitive environment on manufacturing. And you certainly don't get out of that economic mess by resuscitating Wall Street as opposed to reforming it. And you certainly don't get out of that economic mess unless you're going to sit down and develop 
an industrial plan for success. Somebody needs to explain to me, I love Scandinavians, somebody needs to explain to me why Sweden, Finland, and Denmark are way advanced from America on cell technology and on wind turbines and on solar voltaic paneling for solar energy. Why are those three little countries that collectively don't have the population of California advanced and why do the Finns control the majority of the market in cell phone technology? It's because their country decided that they should and the country decided what kind of things that needed to be done to help those industries survive. When the congresswoman talks about the bill saying that we're going to move into uh, high-speed rail and mass transit, <clears throat> I think that's great. But where are we going to get the rail? Because to have a high-speed rail, your rail needs to be much longer, much more free of defects. Uh, you need to have specialty guiding equipment on your trains. You need to have advanced technology. You need to make the cars as well as make the, the engine that will drive it. Uh, none of that technology is currently manufactured in America. So if we're going to have high-speed rail, we'll move people quicker, but where will the jobs come from? If we're saying, which we are saying, we're going to move to the green economy. We're going to have all kinds of new energy generation. And one of the reasons we're going to do that is we don't like being prisoners to foreign oil. I mean, all the other bullshit, but, you know, <laughs> that one too. Okay. But if we're going to move away from foreign oil and become prisoners to Chinese turbines, we're not going to be that much more better off, except we'll have a possibly possibly a cleaner America but a dirtier planet because the steel for those turbines will be made in China. And remember, for every ton of steel, there's three times the carbon emissions in China as the U.S. So to me, we have to be driven by those of us that care about the future and net roots and the bloggers have to become the engine that drives that. Uh, and that's why the alliance is, is important that uh, we've laid out here. You have nothing to lose but Wall Street domination. Because the, the other couple of points, and I'll stop, is that regardless of what you're told, in the long run, you can't sustain family supporting jobs when you're unable to narrow the income gap. And the only way you can narrow the income gap is by really making things that people want to put into the marketplace so you can pay the people that make those things a living wage. The reality is that it's almost, it's almost a 50% differential between the average manufacturing job and the average service sector job. So if you keep going this way, if there's no change in trend lines, the simple question to all the academic eggheads who keep wanting to do the same thing is if you keep going in the same direction, where will you end up? If we keep growing our annual trade deficit from now 800 billion, if we follow the same trajectory, if President Obama and his gang don't change direction, and if he gets a second term, by the end of his second term, we'll be at a trillion dollar a year annual deficit, which will be instead of borrowing two billion a day, borrowing almost three billion a day. If we don't fix health care and we do the same thing for the next seven years as we did for the last seven, health care will be 17 and a half or 18 percent of GDP. If we don't change defense policy to keep buying stuff that we don't really need, or at least learning what we've learned from it to make it in America, 
uh, we'll end up with 40 percent of the GDP in America going down the tube in defense and health care and borrowing $3 billion a day. It can't be sustained. Thanks, Leo. Um, there's a nice segue to, to Marcy Wheeler here. It's something that Leo said uh, during the debate on the auto sector, which was the treatment of blue-collar workers versus Wall Street financiers and how Congress uh, apparently treated folks, Donna Edwards excluded, of course, uh, those who showered before work and those who showered after they got home from work quite differently. Um, and so I wanted, I know Marcy blogged about the whole auto sector uh, restructuring and relief issue extensively, and I thought it would be helpful for, for Marcy to share some of her uh, analysis, thoughts on that, uh, and what may be some of the biases that you ran into uh, in the course of your reporting on that. Um, first, I want to ask you guys a question and see if somebody can answer this for me. There is a state right now that is asking the federal government for $29 million in stimulus funds to keep a car factory open. What's Tennessee. the state? California. California is asking the federal government for $20 million to keep a Toyota factory open. And chances are really good that that effort is going to fail and that those jobs are going to go to Canada um, to make to – and at that point, there will be uh, yet another small energy efficient vehicle that won't be made in the United States, largely because the manufacturer doesn't want to have to pay our health care costs. So mm. I just wanted to start with that because I think it's a really good um, demonstration of a lot of the assumptions we have about the auto industry and manufacturing in general don't necessarily turn out to be true. California is fighting to keep those, uh, I think it's a 4,500 job plant that California is fighting to keep open um, as much as Michigan, as much as Alabama, as much as Kentucky. Um, so I'm not actually an expert in manufacturing, but I um, consulted for Ford for um, five years, mostly working in Asia. Um, and I live in Michigan. My husband, until February when he took a buyout, uh, worked for a supplier. And so I found myself starting last November when this whole car thing happened, um, all of a sudden becoming a car blogger. Those of you who know my work know that before that I was a Dick Cheney blogger and now I'm a car blogger. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and it, it was hard, I mean it was, you know, it was a lot easier than it was to blog about the auto industry because there's so much, so many biases and so much, um, uh, so, so much information that people don't get. I mean, so I started, it took about six weeks for the whole car debate going on before the traditional media figured out that Richard Shelby and Bob Corker, the guys who are saying the American auto industry stinks and has a failed business model, that they're actually car state senators. Like, nobody understood that not only is Tennessee and Alabama their, their auto manufacturing states, but in fact, Alabama by and large produces SUVs. So, you know, Richard Shelby was out there saying, oh gosh, it's a failed business model, and everyone heard it's a failed business model because they're making gas guzzling SUVs. But that's not what Richard Shelby was saying. Richard Shelby was saying we need to break the union, um, and and the the traditional media never called him on it. Um, so it's a partly it's a geographic story. People have no idea where cars are made in this country. People have no idea um, the number of jobs that rely on the auto industry. Um, one thing that I'm kind of amused by on, on the cash for clunkers is, and and on the auto bailout is is uh, and I and I saw this coming. Um, Congress never seriously considered when they were going to do a bailout, they never seriously considered um, making it easier for the auto manufacturers to negotiate with their, um, with their car dealers. And the reason why is because car dealers are one of the biggest employers in every single congressional district around this country. But I mean, and I've, I've, I've worked in dealers stateside and any dealer, I mean, any Ford or GM or Chrysler dealer in this country will tell you one of the reasons why the American brands are cheap, are considered cheap, is because there's another dealer a mile down the road, which means the only thing they have to compete on is price, whereas Toyota and Honda have dealers 50 miles away and they can, they can compete, on, they're basically selling a Honda or a Toyota as the quality vehicle, whereas Ford and GM are 
basically giving, you know, you walk in the door and they're going to give you money back. So um, the, car, the car industry in every district around this country supports a lot of jobs, supports media. At, before this whole crash started, uh, the auto industry supported something like 16% of all local media buys. And so one of the reasons the media is dying is because the auto industry is dying. Um, a timing story, and this is something that, that should be known, and, I, and maybe Leo can talk about this because I think it happened in the steel industry 20 years before it happened in the auto industry. But, you know, it, although we talk a lot about legacy costs, um, there, GM has something like uh, 700,000 retirees. A um, retirees? A million retirees. Toyota in this country has 2,000, basically. And so if you just think about how much it costs to pay for those retirees, and to think that Toyota's not paying those costs in this country. Right there, you have the difference between a high, high quality car and a lower quality car. Because the decisions, I mean, and I can tell you, because I was in Michigan when they were deciding not, I mean, GM started off with as much hybrid technology as did Toyota. And GM couldn't do it profitably. And it, for them, it was a straight bean counter question. I mean, and so now they're doing the Volt. They know they can't do it profitably, but they also know that when they do the Volt, everyone's going to say, as they now do with Toyota, oh, it's this wonderful green company, in spite of the fact that Toyota's pushing Tundras as much as GM is pushing pickup trucks as well. So um, the, 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 the legacy costs are fundamentally the reason why, I mean, Look, um, the, the, the American manufacturing, the American car companies made some boneheaded decisions, and I, I don't doubt that, but the, one of the reasons they made the boneheaded decisions is because of those legacy costs. And if, if you look at, if you're trying to make cars profitably, you can't, you can't do them. But, you know, you can't make Corollas either, so they're going to Canada. Um, an environmental story. The, the, um, the, when I, was, when I was blogging this, I found myself in all of these wonderful conversations with, with uh, tree hugger bloggers, um, and, and they were right. They were saying, you know, we need to get out of cars, we need to be more efficient. Um, but what they didn't, they, there was an inability to understand the ramifications in the industry. So for example, um, you know, my big core story is if you don't bail out GM, China will buy Buick. And that doesn't sound scary to all of you, but there was a Buick car that Dan Neal just reviewed and said, this is better than Lexus. This beats Lexus hands down. And it's joint designed. It's a, it's a, it's a China-US joint design. Um, and China right now, because of the partnership with GM that they've had for a number of years, and this is, this is, this is why China is successful. For GM to go in and sell in the largest growing market in the world, they had to basically give China all their technology, and China is very close to, to being able to produce high quality competitive cars, and when that happens, it won't be the Japanese manufacturers versus the Americans. It absolutely won't be, and, and, um, and that was, I mean, and, and there was a moment in the whole bailout where GM said, well, to be profitable, to hit the new CAFE standards, we want to import the, um, the Chevy Spark, which is an incredibly popular car around the world. Um, but they wanted, it, it's made not just in China, but it's made in inland China. So it's made where, you know, like they're not paying labor basically. And, and the UAW said, no way, you're not going to do that. But, but there, you know, this is the underlying threat is if we don't bail out, if we didn't bail out the auto industry, you you were about to see the last big driver in the manufacturing industry go to China. And it's, it's not that far away. Um, and then the, one of the most amusing things uh, in the whole my experience car blogging was was with the innovation people, and um, I remember Larry Lessig did uh, did a column that said, you know, we just need Apple to take over GM, and if Apple took over GM, everything would be okay. And I I, I was like, well, and first of all, he he was he seemed to be completely ignorant of where. Um, innovation happens in the auto industry, which is in the supply chain, and, and a lot of suppliers that most people have never heard of. Um, but the other amusing thing was, I mean, remember how long it took Apple to get the iPhone, the, the latest generation of the iPhone, correct? Because they had bugs, and they didn't have the supply chain worked out, and they didn't have, if, if the auto industry was allowed to have the, the error rate that Apple or Microsoft has, your car and would go in reverse on the freeway. Yeah, I mean, you, we'd all be dead. We'd all be dead. And so one of the reasons why, you know, a lot of people from Silicon Valley, um, the ones who aren't trying to save that Toyota factory, uh, a, a lot of the reason why 
they perceive the innovation not to be happening in the auto industry is because they have no clue how, you know, the, the, the quality level that frankly is demanded in the auto industry that is not demanded in their industry. And, and even, I mean, if, if you screw up Microsoft Word, what happens, you, you send a patch out by mail. You can't, I mean, I think GM's working on that with the Volt where they're gonna send out new technology to the Volt by, uh, by their satellite system. But, uh, but you, you can't do that with cars. And, and so that, you know, that's a fundamental rule about why the innovation's not happening. So, I mean, those are just some of the challenges I had when I was blogging this story, but I think that they, they, they clarified to me, and I, like I said, I'm not a manufacturing expert, but they really clarified to me um, the story that's not being told about manufacturing and the assumptions that the, you know, the greater part of good lefty union supporting Democrats have about manufacturing, and, and that's the story that I think we really need to, to change. Just to add on to Marcy's, we, d we did 34 cities, 11 states, on the importance of the car industry. The car industry, the automobile industry, is responsible for 7 million jobs in America. And when I have trouble with my car, I boot it. When I have trouble with my computer, I reboot it. Two different things. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good point. Th thank you, Marcy. Um, I want to get some uh, closing thoughts from Tula before we uh, take uh, as many questions as we possibly can from all of you and have some discussion. Um, and Tula has been blogging on issues affecting working people for, uh, for some time and has a lot of experience uh, in this. So I, I wanted to sort of throw an open-ended question about some of your experiences in engaging uh, working families and allies uh, in some campaigns, maybe maybe they weren't directly related to manufacturing, but but some some of the lessons you've learned from that, and then also, and this is sort of to start a conversation with the audience as well, y based on some of the comments, the feedback you've gotten from from your readers and your members, if people if people seem happy with some of the decisions that the Obama administration has made so far as they relate to the issues we're talking about here today on autos and trade and manufacturing. Well, thank you, Scott. And um, I wanted to uh, thank Scott for setting up this great panel. Scott and his team at uh, AAM do a fantastic job of um, getting out these issues that are really critical. And, and so kudos to him and, uh, of course, to President Gerard for, for all of his great work. Um, I quote President Gerard regularly in, in our blogs. Um, he's very quotable. <laughs> <laughs> um, since I am the last speaker, I'm going to keep it really short. Um, you know, as my experience blogging for the AFL-CIO blog, um, I also blog for other sites as well. And, um, you know, there's different, so those are two different audiences. And I've noticed that, you know, it's, it's, we have a hard sell, even among the progressive community, to talk about these issues. And I think um, Congresswoman Edwards has brought up a really good point of connection between, you know, the corporations are doing the same things with trade issues, with manufacturing issues as they're doing with, with all the other issues that we care about, health care, reform, et cetera. Um, and that's, that's a really good way to connect it. Um, but, you know, it's when we blog as a union, as union bloggers, and we blog about manufacturing, or we blog about the need for an industrial policy, or we blog about trade issues, um, you know, it's really hard to not be seen by many in the progressive community and elsewhere as, you know, sort of like throwbacks to the old days. You know, we're, you know, we risk the, the chance of being perceived as hanging on to what we used to have, and and you know, not wanting to go forward. And it's up to us to make the case that an industrial policy that keeping good jobs here is about going forward and that as a nation we're not going to go forward unless we do so. Um, but, you know, at the same time, w to get across our issues, as we did with the Employee Free Choice Act, um, you know, we make the case for issues that seemingly affect only union members, but they don't. The Employee Free Choice Act affects all workers in the United States. and. When we were assisted with, you know, getting out this message and when the Progressive Netroots picked up this message through Fire Dog Lake, through other um, progressive blogs, you know, it really broadened our campaign and really made it clear to people how, how much of an issue these so-called union issues are to everybody. That, you know, it's not just about unions, it's not just about union jobs, it's about all workers, it's about our economy, it's about the future of our nation. Um, so. 
you know, I want to thank all of you who do blog about um, these issues, and I want to encourage everyone to, to contact me at the AFL-CIO um, and, and give me ideas of how you think we can better reach the progressive net roots. I mean, it's, it's critical, and as President George said, you know, the progressive net roots you know, is the media as far as we're concerned. I mean, they're the ones getting the issues right. And, you know, if the progressive net roots was not so powerful, Bill Clinton would not be speaking here tonight. I think <laughs> I think that's that's probably a, a good uh, good standpoint of, of seeing that. Um, so please feel free to email me at the AFL-CIO. I mean, we have um, lots of ways to get out information, and we want to reach out as much as possible to um, everyone and want your ideas on how we can make this successful. And thank you to everyone here who has suggested many ways to do that. Thank you, Tula. I, I'm going to make a brief comment and then throw it open to questions. One of the reasons why we decided to engage and for a, for a manufacturing partnership entering the blogosphere was a, was, seemed to be a daunting task. But I'm an avid reader of blogs. And post-election, I was looking with fascination at some of the recommendations that were being made for Obama's cabinet and for HHS secretary and for all of these, and they were, they were really, really good, great progressive names. I mean, Howard Dean was thrown out. And then I looked at the, at, at the picks for, uh, uh, for trade rep and for commerce department, and, and it, was, it was names from the Clinton administration, like Char Charlene Barshevsky and Mickey Cantor, and these are people who drove a trade policy that drove manufacturing offshore. And I was like, you know what? This isn't, this isn't the blogosphere's uh, problem. Uh, I said, this is, this is because we have not done a very good job of, of connecting on these issues and educating, uh, because while Bill Clinton did many great things for progressives, certainly his trade policy was, was, <laughs> was not one of them. And, and that's why we wanted to get the discussion uh, started. 